morning, everyone. Would the first panel please make their way up here? Uh, my name is Sarah Simonetti. And I'm a third year law student at the law school. And I'm also a participant in the Virginia Coastal Policy Practicum One. My research this semester has focused on the environmental problems that stem from failing septic systems in rural southeastern Virginia and possible policy solutions to help mitigate those problems. So this is why I have the honor of helping to introduce this first panel today, which will discuss resilience related to green and gray infrastructure, as well as septic systems and roads. So on this panel today are Dr. Carl, Carl Hirschner, the director for the Center for Coastal Resources Management at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. We have Lance Gregory, the director for the Division of On-Site Sewage and Water Services, Environmental Engineering, and Marina Programs at the Virginia Department of Health. We have Mr. Curtis Smith, the director of planning at the Accomack Northampton Planning District Commission. And finally, we have Ms. Angela King, the Assistant Director for the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. So please welcome our first panel. Thank you. Well, how does all this work? Okay. So how do we... All right. So if you want to advance the PowerPoint, you use this. If you want to call up an event, you use that. And if I want to get to the talks? Oh, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> How upscale. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the introductions, and thank you for coming. And I guess I'm supposed to say good morning. Um, good morning. Hey. All right. I, we're going to go through the three subject areas that you just heard mentioned, starting with a brief discussion of green infrastructure and some of the planning that we are trying to uh, do in the Commonwealth for identification of green infrastructure, which provides benefits for resilience uh, along with some of the other things that we are interested in preserving and protecting in our undeveloped and natural lands. And so, um, what we're interested in, in trying to set aside undeveloped lands, uh, is to provide multiple benefits. Uh, from the protections of those lands. And as the subject of this conference is focused on, we're particularly interested today in how they can provide additional resilience to communities that are adjacent to them at the same time that they provide the ecological integrity for the landscape, some of the water quality benefits, uh, some of the other things that we typically try and manage these lands for. And so we are going to uh, take a look at approaches to identifying natural and nature-based features and then prioritizing them based on interest in those multiple benefits. The natural and nature-based features is kind of a state-of-the-art uh, phrase that's used these days and for those of us who work in the field, we don't keep saying natural and nature-based features, NNBFs, that's what rolls off the tongue. So I'm gonna be talking about NNBFs. The approach that we're taking to try and identify NNBFs that can provide multiple benefits is one that looks first at what their capacity to mitigate flooding uh, damages is. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of the analysis that's being used for that. Those analyses can then be combined with pre-existing work that has been done by uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation's National uh, Heritage Program by the Department of Environmental Quality's Coastal Zone Management Program over the preceding decades, actually, this work has been going on, trying to identify lands that are particularly valuable for their ecological uh, role in preserving habitat and uh, providing uh, some natural framework for the uh, activities that we conduct on our landscape. And so we'll try and combine what we are doing to identify resilience services with those pre-existing analyses of ecological services. And then we're looking at a number of alternative uh, interests or benefits that might be provided and how those might help us further refine the targeting of lands that we would like to uh, attempt to preserve and protect. So the, the existing 
uh, ecological analyses, as I just mentioned. There are quite a few of them that have been done. The two that sort of leap out are the Virginia Natural Lands Assessment done by the DCR folks, also known in the parlance as vanilla. Um, not the DCR, that's the shorthand for the uh, assessment. <laughs> and then the Virginia Ecological Value Assessment, also known as VIVA, we're big on acronyms, um, that's the one that was done by the Coastal Zone Management Program. So we're, I'm, we're going to look at those two. This, for example, is what the vanilla assessment has identified as lands in the Commonwealth that are particularly important for preserving and maintaining the uh, connectivity of natural lands, allowing for <coughs> biodiversity to preserve, allowing for migration patterns, etc. cetera. Uh, and this is the VIVA assessment, which is naturally focused on the coastal zone and includes not only the land-based uh, features, but also some of the water-based features. Again, trying to identify particularly important areas for protection or preservation uh, so that in combination, they provide a very strong framework. Looking at the, uh, the resilience features or services that are provided by NNBFs, this is the list of natural features that we are particularly uh, trying to identify and understand. We have mapped them, so here's an example of mapping those features on the existing landscape. This happens to be uh, Gwynn's Island, if you're familiar with it, it's up in Matthews County, sits right on the Chesapeake Bay. But what this is showing you is that we are able to map the actual aerial extent of all of those NMBF features, and we are attempting to do this across the Commonwealth. With that information, we are then able to assess the capacity of those features to provide flood resilience. And so in this case, what we're particularly interested in is their natural capacity based on the type of vegetation uh, that exists, the type of soils that they're on, to impede water movement and reduce wave energy. And you can see here the sort of starting assessment that's been developed for those features. This allows us to score their capacity, and then based on where they sit in the landscape, we're able to I, assess their opportunity to provide those uh, services. And so again, here's a small part of Gwynn's Island uh, with some of that information mapped, and the, the things that you can see here is it really depends not only on what kind of feature you are, but where you sit in the landscape. And the analysis that allows us then to get to uh, exactly what role they can play in flood resilience or flood mitigation is one that involves a number of the digital data sets that exist for the entire Commonwealth. In this case, it's not just where do those features sit, it's where are all the buildings that we want to protect. And so there is actually a coverage of all the, land, uh, all the building footprints uh, across the Commonwealth. There's some, what, three and a half million of them, I think. Uh, I look at the people who actually did the work back here for assurance. <laughs> um, and once we know where the buildings are, we know where they sit in the landscape, we also have very highly resolved uh, topographic data. So we can, we can, as you see here, map the path that flooding waters will follow across the landscape as they rise to contact those buildings. And we cleverly call them inundation pathways, IPs for short, in Armenia for uh, acronyms. With that information, here's Gwynn's Island, there are all the buildings on Gwynn's Island, and there are all the inundation pathways, so the ways that water will move to those buildings. With that information, it's a simple step. I say simple because I'm not the one doing this work. Uh, it's a simple step to look at all the NMBFs that lie in those pathways. And so now you have a way to begin valuing each natural or nature-based feature for its role in impeding flooding waters from reaching buildings that we value. That information developed across the entire Commonwealth is what we are attempting to do. And the goal would be to take this assessment, here you see that small part of Gwynn's Island with the NMBS rated or now ranked for their uh, services, their flood mitigation value, and combine that with some of the other assessments that have already been done, in this case, the ecological value assessments. With that, we can begin to refine the targeting for lands that should become a priority for preservation with those two motivations in mind. And so here you see the Eastern Shore, 
On the left-hand side, we have valued the natural and nature-based features for their uh, capacity to provide some flood resilience. And on the right, you see the valuation of those features for uh, their, their ecological uh, integrity services. Put all those together and you end up with a smaller subset of the features which can do both things. And so this is the process of adding different sorts of uh, interests in preservation or uh, benefits derived from preservation to refine what actually gets uh, protected on the landscape. One pr quick example, one of the things that we were looking at was economic stress in the community. So the idea would be that if you're going to preserve lands that provide these benefits, why not do it adjacent to communities which have not, do not have the resources to acquire, protect, or preserve, or otherwise build resilience and resilient features themselves. And so working with a colleague here at William & Mary, Sarah Stafford in the Public Policy Program, she developed an economic stress index for us, which is now applied across the entire Commonwealth at the census tract level. And you see it here on the Eastern Shore, identifying relative economic stress in the communities. These are the metrics for that uh, stress index. If you want more information about it, it will be available shortly. Uh, you put all of that together, and what this does is once again further refine the targeting of NMBFs that one might choose to try and preserve or protect, in this case for not only ecological services, but also flood resilience, as well as uh, benefits for economically distressed communities. And so, with that, let me turn it over to Angela. Good morning, everyone. You guys are getting better. <laughs> My name's Angela King. I'm the Assistant Director at the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. And as Dr. Hirschner said, these natural and nature-based features provide a variety of benefits. And the decision to target the protection of these lands based on certain factors is, in and of itself, the policy decision here. So our recommendations are really going to focus more on what tools need to be in place to successfully implement this decision. As a first step, there's a need for increased awareness and education regarding the benefits that these lands provide. And this is important because many of these projects are going to require coordination with multiple stakeholders. So it's important that education and outreach efforts are tailored according to the audience that you're trying to involve in the project. For example, Private property owners may be most concerned with financial considerations, such as how much it's going to cost them to maintain the feature long term, as well as what types of um, cost savings opportunities might be available for them. For example, are there tax credits or tax exemptions that may be um, available? While local governments, on the other hand, might be more interested in how the protection of these features can help them meet various mandatory or voluntary program requirements, such as stormwater management regulations, Chesapeake Bay TMDLs, or obtaining credits under the NFIP's community rating system. There's also a need to evaluate the funding options that are out there and determine how these programs may overlap with one another, as well as how they may conflict, so that we can more effectively leverage ourselves for available funding. Local governments have the authority to generate revenue to support green infrastructure uh, through the establishment of a stormwater utility fee or the creation of a service district for the purposes of beach and shoreline management and restoration. And they also have the ability to obtain matching grant funds from various state programs, such as the Stormwater Local Assistance Fund for water quality BMPs, such as buffer and wetlands restoration. There's also the Dam Safety Flood Prevention and Protection Assistance Fund, which while mainly utilized for dam safety projects, also provides funding for things like floodplain studies, flood risk assessments, and the development of flood mitigation strategies. Of the 34 projects that were funded under this program in 2018, only four of them fell under the Flood Prevention and Protection branch of the program. So it seems there might be an opportunity there to better utilize that resource. Another potential option is the Shoreline Resiliency Fund. And while this was an innovative tool when it was created back in 2016, and it's structured to support localities in providing low interest loan programs to residents and businesses subject to recurrent flooding, 
it's, um, it has yet to be funded, so it's an empty shell, and localities are unable to use it. There are also multiple funding options at the federal level. The National Fish and Wildlife Foundation's Coastal Resilience Fund supports projects to restore or expand natural features to minimize storm impacts, and they also have a small watershed grants program to support community-based efforts to protect and restore the Chesapeake Bay's natural resources. We also have FEMA hazard mitigation assistance programs. These include hazard mitigation grants, pre-disaster mitigation grants, and flood mitigation assistance. But an improved understanding of the relationship between these various programs, both the ones with overarching goals of water quality protection, as well as the ones that seek to increase flood protection, would help identify potential synergies between the programs, as well as potential inconsistencies that may be barriers which need to be addressed moving forward. And then the last point would be that um, in addition to the benefits of ecological value and flood protection, we should also consider other benefits that these features can provide and how those other benefits might open up new partnership or funding opportunities. For example, low-lying lands that serve as natural buffers and provide flood protection value could be donat to, donated to public access authorities and in turn provide recreational opportunities. Additionally, these same lands could um, provide valuable educational research opportunities as evident by a collaboration on the Middle Peninsula between a graduate student studying living shorelines and the public access authority there. Projects could also be structured as a community development tool. For example, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation has worked with local governments and community organizations to convert transportation infrastructure like highway underpasses into innovative green infrastructure projects that include not only urban, urban parks and recreational opportunities, but also public art and cultural amenities that serve to spur revitaliz revitalization in the area. Private actors also have an important role to play, and they can be incentivized to maintain or create natural buffer areas through the development of transfer of development rights programs, which establish sending and receiving areas as a means to direct development towards the most appropriate and suitable locations within the community. Norfolk has incorporated a similar approach into its new resilient zoning ordinance. There they've established coastal resilience and upland resilience overlay districts, as well as a resilience quotient system for new development and redevelopment. The coastal resilience overlay districts include the high risk flood areas and they have increased requirements such as higher first floor elevations or increased open space and landscaping standards. While the upland resilience areas are outside of the high flood risk areas and provide an opportunity for developers to meet lower resilience requirements if they take actions like acquiring a conservation easement on a property within the coastal resilience overlay. So in closing, to best support the Commonwealth's land conservation goals, it's important that we take efforts to increase awareness and education about the benefits that these lands provide have a better understanding about the various programs and funding opportunities available and how they may complement one another, and consider benefits beyond ecological value and flood protection that might provide new opportunities for partnerships and funding. Thank you. Okay, that was green infrastructure. Now we turn to some of the challenges in gray infrastructure and we're going to start with one of the more interesting ones in septic systems. So Lance Gregory from the Health Department. Good morning. I uh, want to thank Virginia Coast Policy Center and Elizabeth for inviting me to speak with you all today and uh, was asked to come and talk about some of the issues uh, that we face in the on-site sewage program or septic program. Um, and it, it really starts with this mindset of out of sight, out of, sight, out of mind. Uh, a lot of homeowners have their on-site sewage system. There's no components above grade. And so they don't even see uh, where that effluent's going. And so it makes it easy for them to kind of forget about the system. Um, there's no check engine light that lets them know that there's an issue going on. And that results in potentially that system backing up or breaking out on the ground surface before they recognize there's a problem. Um, 
that can result in some public health and environmental health issues uh, by not taking that proactive actions and measures uh, to do operation and maintenance on their systems uh, and having that result in a system failure. Those failures can have direct impacts on public health and the environment. Uh, they can result in uh, bacterial impairments of streams. They can result in uh, closures of shellfish harvesting areas. Uh, so there's a lot of potentially negative impacts of those uh, failing systems. But in addition to that, it's on-site sewage systems are a known impairment uh, for nitrogen in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we represent about three to four percent of the nitrogen load uh, in the bay. And there, there was a recent study in Fairfax County that found uh, there were a number of systems that were properly installed uh, under less stringent uh, requirements under previous regulations. And the systems were functioning properly, but they were able to source back the nitrogen uh, in, in a tributary to the Potomac River uh, was coming from on-site sewage systems. So even when they're functioning properly, if it's a system that was installed under less stringent regulations may uh, be having impacts on public health and the environment. And so we need better data uh, to help us quantify those potential impacts, things like the number of septic pump outs that are occurring, you know, how many BMPs are actually being installed um, but it's also looking at the, the potential impacts involved with recurrent flooding and things of that nature. A lot of these systems are uh, located in low-lying areas. Um, and so that gets to another uh, issue that we have, which is, is funding. Um, unlike municipal systems, the cost of repairing, operating, maintaining these systems falls solely on the individual, the property owner. And so that's why it's easy to have that out of sight, out of mind mentality is, you know, they don't, they don't want to have to think about having to pay for that repair. Uh, with conventional systems, so your typical systems, those can cost uh, on average $7,500 to, to repair. And with alternative systems and more sensitive environments, those costs can go upwards of eighteen dollars to $20,000 to pay for a repair. And we have about four to, uh, 4,500, uh, 4,000 to 4,500 repairs every year in the Commonwealth. Some of those are simple component uh, fixes, but many of those are complete system uh, replacements. And with those failing systems, there's, there's a limited amount of funding available. Uh, DEQ has a 319 grant program. Uh, the Middle Peninsula Planning District Commission does an excellent job. Uh, with getting funding out. Uh, we've recently uh, been awarded a grant at VDH uh, from the Virginia Environmental Endowment and also uh, the Smithfield Foundation that we're really excited about, uh, but certainly more is needed when you think about the scope of failing systems within the Commonwealth and the potential impacts those could have on uh, public health and the environment. In, in addition to kind of this uh, state level where we're trying to look for more opportunities for funding. There is a push on a national level uh, to get more funding into on-site sewage programs. Um, so very interested in, in, uh, in that and, and hopeful that that moves forward. Um, but the, it becomes a, a significant need because of there's so many low income households that, uh, that we're dealing with. And that makes it very difficult when we're working with enforcement. Uh, you have a lot of homeowners that have limited funds. There's limited grant funds or loan funds available. And when they're facing a repair that might be as much as $18,000, uh, that makes it a real struggle for us uh, in terms of enforcement. Your options are, are you going to make them vacate the property? Or are you going to do some kind of temporary kind of Band-Aid repair to that system? Uh, or do you take some kind of criminal enforcement? And, and none of those are really great <coughs> options. Uh, I, I, Obviously, ideally, we'd want to have a proper system installed that fully uh, protects public health and the environment. And one way that this has been addressed uh, within Virginia is to allow for waivers. Uh, so the Code of Virginia allows owners that are uh, low income, they can't afford that repair, that needs pretreatment or pressure uh, disposal. It allows them to install a system without that uh, pretreatment at a lower cost. Um, and there are some stipulations on the transfer of that property, uh, but the system's not fully protective of public health and the environment. And that, that waiver process is a result of, uh, of a need to, 
to address this lack of funding issue. In a lot of these issues, we, we've been trying to think of a way that we could uh, categorize those in a, a more succinct way, and we've been using the term wastewater islands uh, to describe situations where individuals or communities just don't have access to affordable wastewater solutions uh, that are fully protective of public health and the environment. So these could be uh, not just uh, economic uh, considerations, but also social considerations. You know, maybe you have a situation where there's just not uh, access to sewer or you have poor soils or you have low income and those factors are, are working together to create issues. So how, how do we get to, uh, to trying to address these? I think the, the key first step for us is, is data. We, we need uh, better data within our on-site sewage program. Uh, we do have some significant gaps um, because uh, of the way that historically our data has been collected. And that makes it difficult for us to quantify the need for funding uh, to fully address these wastewater islands and other issues in the state. Uh, we estimate there's about one million systems, uh, a little over one million on-site sewage systems in Virginia. Uh, so a considerable percentage of homes in Virginia are served by these systems. Uh, but that estimate is based on a couple of different ways. Uh, so the first part of this uh, chart that you see here, the uh, 700,000, that's data that we have from the 1990 census. So that was a question on the 1990 census. Do you have an on-site sewage system or are you connected to public sewer? And so that we're fairly confident in that number. And then in 20, uh, 2003, we started our environmental health database where we began collecting data on these systems. And we have a little over 200,000 systems in that database that have been installed uh, since that time. And we're fairly confident in that data. Uh, but we also have that data gap there between those two where we estimate about 183,000 systems were installed, but that's, a, that's a, a, an estimate. And the 707,000 is, uh, you know, I think it's a good number, but, but it's still an estimate. We don't have a, a hard and fast number. Uh, and so we need to close that data gap, um, and we're working towards a complete inventory. We're, uh, we're hopeful that we can do that. Um, but more resources are needed. And uh, another factor I guess I'll point out, uh, it's not just important to know how many systems are out there, but how many systems are failing, how many systems maybe were installed under less stringent regulations, so maybe they're not quite as protective of public health and the environment uh, as we would like is another important factor. And I mentioned all these issues and how we're looking at uh, trying to address them is a, a kind of a broader changing approach to public health throughout the nation. And, and that's looking at this uh, public health pyramid. So kind of shifting the focus from uh, education and interventions and trying to get more towards uh, changing, changing decision making. How, how do we make owners make good decisions on their own without a regulatory process? Um, and getting to those socioeconomic factors uh, that create uh, disparities uh, with on-site sewage systems. Um, I'm really excited uh, about the work that's going on in regards to wastewater islands and the work that VIMS is doing uh, to help us identify those areas. Um, I think that's a great example. Uh, also, the f increasing in funding that we're seeing I think is going to be a great uh, example of how we're trying to get to the bottom of that pyramid to address socioeconomic factors, uh, but, but we need more of that and uh, we need to get the right data. I think that's uh, the, the starting point for us uh, so that we can put the right policies and regulations in place to help us ensure that all Virginians have access to wastewater solutions that are protective of public health and the environment. And I, I say all this, I note a lot of issues, and I didn't want to end too, uh, on, on too much of a low note. So I will say, <laughs> on a high note, we do have uh, staff that work in every locality in the state and our people are our greatest resource at VDH. Um, we're part of the community. Uh, we work in partnership with, uh, with local governments, and uh, so I think that, that gives us a good foundation towards trying to address those issues moving forward.
Thank you, Lance. So uh, what I'm going to do here is run through some of the work that we are trying to do to help the health department identify where there are failing septic systems and or where potentially future issues may arise. And to drop right to the bottom line message, uh, what we carried away from the work to date, which has only been going on for about a month now, is the need for more and better data. So as Lance has just been saying, more and better data is going to be the solution to this ultimately. But here's where we, uh, here's where we are. Uh, the first question we were asked is to sort of scope the, the question, how big an issue is this across the Commonwealth? Well, logically one would say, what kind of data do we have across the entire Commonwealth to answer that? And so what we did was we pulled up that coverage that I say we, again, it was not me, this was, uh, and it wasn't as simple as pushing a button and there's the, there's the coverage. It took a lot of work to put this together, but we pulled up where all the buildings are in the Commonwealth. And then we looked at where are all the impaired waters, surface waters in the Commonwealth, ones that have been identified as impaired based on bacterial uh, loads. And then finally, well not finally, but the third coverage was where are all the sewer systems in the Commonwealth? So if you put those together, you would expect that the problem that Lance has just been identifying is going to occur where there are houses that aren't connected to sewer systems and are adjacent to impaired waters. And so we did that. We also then went looking again at where there are uh, economic stresses which would prevent people from being able to install or maintain uh, an effective wastewater treatment system. And so here's the uh, health or the economic stress index again that I told you about previously. You put all that together, you get a really messy map. Uh, and as one of our legislators uh, notoriously told us, when you look at this, you come away with a sense that for identifying failing septic systems or potentially failing systems, it is a target-rich environment. Uh, and so what I have outlined here in, in yellow is by no means the uh, priority areas is just examples of where there are houses adjacent to impaired waters uh, and there is economic stress and there is no septics or no sewer system. So it's a, it's a way to begin to hone down, but we still end up with targets pretty much everywhere uh, and that's not real useful when you're trying to uh, manage limited resources to address this. So the second approach was to take some more refined information and add it to all of that. And in this case, we're working very closely with the health department in trying to access and utilize the information that they've been collecting, uh, particularly since uh, 2003, but whatever sort of local knowledge they have. And again, the take home message from this exercise is that there is a need for resources invested in the health department to enable them to standardize that data, make it consistent across the Commonwealth so that it becomes useful in trying to answer and analyze these questions. So in addition to the, the four basic coverages that I just showed you, one of the things that logically one would want to bring to this analysis is soils information. And this is available uh, across the Commonwealth, not easily utilized at the scales that we need to work at, uh, but one can pull up information on the soils and get all kinds of data about their depth to groundwater, their permeability, their suitability for wastewater systems, et cetera. We have added to that, we're working specifically to develop this whole process in Lancaster County uh, because they came to us early on and indicated a concern there not just for failing septic systems, but that the failing septic systems were impacting their growing aquaculture industry. And so there was concern that investments by private individuals in developing an aquaculture uh, business would be compromised either now or in the near term by failing systems which made the waters unsuitable for growing uh, shellfish for direct market. So in, in Lancaster County, here's a, this is a blow up, so all those little green dots, those are the houses. Uh, the buildings that look so massively blobbish in the state level coverage. The uh, red areas are are areas that have been identified by the Division of Shellfish Sanitation 
as not meeting the water quality standards for growing shellfish. Uh, and then we're gonna look at this lower right corner. Uh, this is elevation. So as Lance said, a lot of these systems are found in low-lying areas. So of course you wanna consider what the elevations are here. Uh, and when we put all that together, uh, what we end up with is an idea of where systems, whoops, this isn't the one I want, um, where systems are currently found that are failing, that they do know are failing, and what the characteristics of those sites might be. So we bring in the soils data. This happens to be the depth of the water table uh, for the soils data. We use the elevation data. We use the uh, location of the houses. We use the location of the impaired waters. And we're using the information that the health department has on where septic systems have had permits issued for repairs. We're using the information at each one of those little red dots uh, on the properties at those dots to give us a set of characteristics which ought to identify other, or may, identify other lots which may have failing septic systems or in the future may have failing septic systems since we can obviously simulate sea level rise and know what the impacts of that will be on groundwater levels. That's sort of where we stand currently. Uh, the targeting has, uh, is progressing. Uh, in fact, as of yesterday, there was some advances in the, the analyses that people in the CCRM have been trying to do to identify the characteristics which are most useful in helping to target future failures or potential existing failures. And it's only because Elizabeth made me put this talk together on Monday that I can't show you that slide. You just have to take my word for it. Lance can take some comfort in that we are making progress, but there is a long way to go. And the fact of the matter is, this information that we're using in Lancaster is not uniformly available across the state. So there is a lot of work to be done with the health department and other agencies in building the information database that will be uh, ultimately helping us to scope the problem, let the General Assembly know just how big an issue this might be, and help the Health Department in identifying where uh, to target their efforts to, to solve some of this problem. And so, Angela. Okay. So we've heard a lot about data this morning, and I just want to again stress how important that is to this discussion. In order for us to determine appropriate solutions for moving forward, we first need an idea of what problem we're actually dealing with. So we need a better understanding of what types of systems are installed, where they're located, and when they were installed, so we understand which regulations applied at that time. And answering these questions will require funding to modernize previous collection and reporting efforts, as well as to support new eff efforts to gather and map this information. And once we have these details, we need to identify what types of solutions will be most feasible and most effective. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, some of the issues may be solved by connecting to a, a municipal sewer system, while others, the appropriate solution may be to repair an existing system or in, to install a new one that's fully compliant with current regulations. So in addition to creating this inventory of the systems, it would also be useful to conduct an assessment of potential solutions so we can frame the magnitude of the funding need. Having this will allow us to tailor our funding mechanisms to match with these solutions. And once we have an idea of where the gaps may be with respect to funding, we can explore changes to existing repair and replacement programs, as well as the establishment of new funding programs to support things like connection to public sewer, helping low-income customers pay those monthly sewer fees, and also covering the design and installation of on-site systems for property owners. In addition to the Department of Health needing more data, there's also a need for the general public to be better informed, both about how these systems function, as well as about the financial assistance that's available. Improving education to this audience is likely to improve overall operation and maintenance practices, which in turn will help extend the life of these systems and also reduce repair costs for the property owners. A additionally, increased awareness on their part is likely to lead to improved public and environmental health outcomes as they have a better understanding of the connection between water quality and the functioning of their system. 
And if they have a better awareness of financial assistance that is out there, they might be more likely to seek help whenever they're having a problem. There are many funding sources out there to help property owners. There are regional nonprofits like the Southeast Rural Community Assistance Project, federal en entities such as USDA, state agencies like VDH and DCR. Um, and these funding structures can be in the form of low interest loan programs or grant programs, and they can be used for a variety of septic related tasks. But although there are a lot of resources out there, they're not without their limitations. They may be limited in the amount of funding that they can provide, who's eligible to apply for the funding, or what the funding can actually be used for. So if we look at three programs which VDH provides with respect to on-site septic, we can identify some of those potential limitations. They have a betterment loan eligibility program where property owners that receive a permit to repair, replace, or upgrade a failing or non-compliant system, as well as those that are voluntarily upgrading a non-failing system to improve um, public health and water quality, they're eligible to uh, receive a betterment loan from a private lender. So applicants are advised to speak with legal counsel or with their bank to identify an appropriate lender. So in addition to this step being a potential barrier, other limitations include that it's a loan program, it's not a grant program, so it needs to be paid back, and new construction projects are not eligible under this program. There's also an on-site operation and maintenance fund which supports training of operators and also the reporting system that's been established for the operation and maintenance requirements for alternative systems. And a third program is an indemnification fund that provides homeowners with funding assistance for repairing or replacing a system or its components that have failed within three years of installation due to the negligence of VDH. So potential limitations there include that it's a reimbursement rather than an upfront loan or grant, failure must occur within three years of installation, and the failure must be a result of VDH's negligence. There is not a Department of Health program that provides loans or grants directly to property owners for installation of a system upfront. And as we look at our funding options and consider ways we might want to modify or expand them, we can look to other states for, to see how they're handling the issue. In Minnesota, they increase their state sales tax and they direct a portion of this revenue into a clean water fund, which is then distributed out at the county level for purposes of providing grants to low-income homeowners that have non-compliant systems. In Oregon and many counties within Washington State, a regional nonprofit called Craft 3 utilizes state funds, private foundation funds, and also money from private investors to provide non-traditional financing to homeowners to cover the full cost of designing, permitting, and installing these systems, and in some cases has been used to connect these homeowners to a nearby municipal system. Alabama also has a unique approach a nonprofit trade group there, the Alabama On-Site Wastewater Association, sponsors a program where manufacturers and installers provide their, project, their products and services to low-income applicants, and in return, they receive continuing education credits. Because so many funding options do exist, it would be useful to inventory the various resources so that our planning district commissions, localities, state agencies, and property owners can better position themselves to utilize and leverage the available funds. And one way to achieve this might be to establish a grant administrator position to handle this task. And then Lance had mentioned, we also need to look at ways to encourage property owners to be more proactive with respect to maintaining and monitoring their systems. Because the repairs can be so expensive and property owners may not be able to um, pay for the repair, the Department of Health is left with limited responses to that. They can require that they vacate the property, they can allow temporary corrections, or they can take criminal enforcement action. Lance had mentioned the waiver that's available, and while that does help with respect to the high cost of repairs, it's not protective of public health and water quality. So some ways to be more proactive with respect to the proper functioning of systems could be to establish maintenance reporting requirements for conventional systems. This is similar in nature to the operation and maintenance requirements that exist for alternative systems, but having this type of reporting requirement would provide the Department of Health with better program oversight and access to information regarding the functionality of conventional systems. 
This is not a new idea. Legislation establishing these reporting requirements was proposed during the last General Assembly session, but ultimately it was continued to this upcoming session. Another option could be to expand Chesapeake Bay Preservation Area pump out or inspection requirements to the entire Bay watershed, or if the overall goal really is water quality protection, expand, expand this requirement statewide. Um, similar to establishing maintenance reporting, this would motivate property owners to take a more active role. It is important to recognize that either of these options would result in increased costs to the property owner, as well as to the state agency managing the program. So we would need to consider changes that might be necessary to existing funding structures or even the creation of new funding sources to balance this increased cost. Septic system failures pose threats to both environmental and public health, and as we deal with sea level rise and recurrent flooding, the number of failures may only increase in certain areas. The Coastal Policy Center is in the process of finalizing an on-site septic report that provides background on this issue and evaluates recommendations for moving forward. We'll be posting that to our website soon. Our website is listed on the back of your program, so we invite you to check it out. Thank you for your time. So we have heard about um, trying to preserve features in our landscape which are already providing benefits for resilience uh, and ensuring that we are, are efficient and effective in targeting and, and setting those aside. And we've discussed a problem for resilience that we know exists, uh, but we are having trouble uh, bounding so that we can be efficient and effective in our response to it. And next, we're going to talk about a problem that we know is coming uh, and that we need to begin now to prepare for. And so to introduce this in transportation, we have Curtis Smith from the Eastern Shore, the Executive Director of the Planning District Commission there. And they've been a leader in looking at the challenges that this will entail. And so we're going to get Curtis to tell us a little bit about their work. Thank you, Dr. Hershner. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was asked today to come to speak on behalf of the Eastern Shore and, and really for, for all the rural coastal Virginia localities um, with regards to vulnerabilities and um, challenges with regards to uh, resilience planning for uh, transportation infrastructure with a primary focus on roads. That's, that's pretty much where we're going to be sticking to today. Where's my, uh, I'm missing it there. Oh, thank you. So, okay, this is uh, not showing up, unfortunately, on the white background, but, <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, the, uh, so the Eastern Shore, uh, I figured many of you are familiar with where it is geographically, so um, I find a good way to illustrate who we are is with this nighttime image from the space station. Um, so there we are in that circle there. We're about a 75 mile long peninsula. Uh, we we uh, have about 45,000 residents roughly. This number is actually fewer than the number of people that lived there about a century ago when um, the, the growth in our transportation infrastructure actually made our two counties and 19 incorporated towns uh, some of the most prosperous rural communities in America. Um, take that, Los Angeles County, who was number three in the 1920s. <laughs> so we were actually number one and number two in the 1920s. And at that time, when our railroad was constructed in the late 1800s, the Eastern Shore and its agricultural um, economy and its seafood economy, we basically, once we were opened up via railroad to the, the urban crescent around us, as you can see in this image, um, we've, we basically fed uh, the urban growth around that area, and that's how we became so prosperous. And our transportation infrastructure, it really was transformational over a period of several decades. The Eastern Shore, when you, you think we're rural now, you should have seen us before the railroad came in. Um, <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we, uh, much of our transportation infrastructure was constructed at that time. And 
it's been aging in place ever since with, uh, with very little attention placed to it in terms of long-term maintenance. And uh, it's becoming an increasingly major issue, as you would expect. So I, I always like to highlight that we have uh, three unique challenges on the eastern shore and that we have three incorporated towns located on islands. I'm not going to go into great detail because you all can imagine what challenges that comes with, but Shinkatig Island, Saxis Island, Tangier Island, that's a whole other talk for another time. <laughs> we have uh, major, major facilities that are critical to our economy and our livelihoods that are located either on islands or at the ends of necks. We're very spread out. And uh, this ranges from the Nassau Wallops Flight Facility and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, the, uh, the uh, uh, Aztec Island National Seashore, we have two national wildlife refuges, and the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. These are all critical to who we are. And, uh, and we, uh, we won the state lottery for having the, uh, the most land susceptible to inundation from sea level rise. Um, so, uh, so, so yay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, I, when I speak to folks about, oh great, this came up, uh, this is great. Uh, so when I speak to folks about uh, rural infrastructure in general, there often seems to be a misconception about uh, how much of it there is. Uh, we have 1,500 miles of primary and secondary roads on the eastern shore. So we have a lot, that's a lot of infrastructure. That's enough to build a road to get you from Williamsburg to Austin, Texas. So imagine that network wrapped up on the eastern shore in there, and that's the challenge right there. 1,500 miles of road, the vast majority of which are secondary roads, um, which receive, any, over recent history especially, even less attention in terms of uh, maintenance and, and things like that. Um, we have numerous causeways leading out to those facilities. They were constructed around that time that our, our region grew. Um, they, were, they were constructed on poor foundations. They were constructed very low. And uh, they are critical to, um, especially to Shinkatig Island and the federal facilities um, on, on Assateague Island, uh, the, the, the uh, town of Saxis as well. Uh, connected by causeways. Um, and in, in recent years, uh, the secondary roads and, and the bridges as well, um, the, only, the only attention they're getting is, is in, the, in the realm of maintenance. Um, it's very difficult and it's, it's not a common occurrence to see significant reconstruction projects on the vast majority of these 1,500 miles of roads that, that, that need significant work. I'd say over my lifetime, there, there may have been in the neighborhood of, of uh, a dozen to a dozen and a half uh, significant reconstruction projects on secondary roads on the eastern shore. Um, they're, they're very costly. They can, depending on the length of them, obviously, they can run anywhere from the neighborhood of three upwards to 15 to 20 million dollars, depending on the situation. So when you, you, you do the simple math, and, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a major challenge. The VDOT design horizons are not crafted to uh, be able to, to comprehensively consider the challenges that are coming to our area with regards to sea level rise. For primary roads, 22 years is the design horizon for a significant reconstruction project or a new road, 11 years for secondary road projects, and for bridges it's 50 years. In 2011, uh, VDOT assessment found that we had five structurally deficient bridges and 15 that were functionally obsolete. The now, since 2011, to VDOT's credit, the, a lot of those immediate needs, the five structurally deficient bridges, um, have been addressed, but there's 15 more coming down the pike that are just as old, and, and we're not keeping pace with the needs as they age. Um, there's an, this is a rough back of the envelope calculation, but we have roughly 3,000 miles of roadside ditches, and um, that's a whole nother talk, perhaps another conference on uh, <laughs> ditches. Um, and we're just starting to get working on that, thanks to Dr. Hirschner and his team. You'll hear more um, in, in the near future about that. But, uh, and it's a tremendous opportunity for coastal resilience. Um, the vast, vast majority of these are, uh, are, are not paved you know, infrastructure. They're dug ditches, um, permeable features. And we rely on a number of creeks, um, over 50 creeks that need dredging, um, that, are, that are responding to um, the changes in our dynamic uh, 
coastlines, the railroad I've spoken about, that is vulnerable at, at the southern terminus and airports. And, uh, and oh yeah, we, uh, we, we transport things to outer space as well from a barrier island. And uh, it's a major issue because that, you know, is, is potentially our next railroad. So the railroad that grew us, the, the Wallops Flight Facility, has the greatest potential for us. I think that's what makes us a, a unique rural region. So back to focus on roads. <clears throat> the, uh, in, in 2015, we conducted the first regional study in partnership with VDOT, um, thanks to the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program and, and NOAA, who we couldn't have done this without. <clears throat> the, uh, this essentially was a screening level assessment uh, just to determine which roads would potentially go under when. And, and how that might affect accessibility to some of the roads, to some of the communities and facilities that could be viable, but you may not be able to access them. Uh, it's, it was using existing data, um, focusing on VDOT Road center lines. We, we knew the, elevate, the rough elevate, well, not rough, but uh, approximate elevations of the, the, the tops of the roads. We had all the information we needed in terms of where the water would be under various scenarios. We put it together for a, a, what is a relatively simple uh, assessment compared to what you'll, you'll hear from Dr. Hirschner um, soon. Um, but the intent was to have it as a conversation starter, both at the local and the state level. So perhaps that's why I'm, I'm here today. And so that's good. Um, now, now what you're going to see may be scary in the following slides, but, but keep this in mind too that this assessment really is only looking at still water conditions above mean higher high water. So I like to think of that as this might even be the best case scenario for us in certain situations because it's not considering uh, atmospheric or um, um, even astronomical conditions. It's not considering groundwater inundation. It's not considering slowing of the Gulf Stream and what that might do to our sea level rise projections. So a number of factors that could potentially worsen what I'm going to show you. So keep that food for thought. So where will the inundation occur and when will it occur? So uh, we use the, uh, the NOAA sea level rise outputs to, to basically look at where the water would, would be. And in one foot, we found that it would inundate uh, approximately 33 miles of roads. This is above mean higher high water, of course, and that's, that's about 2% of our roads and, uh, and, and so as you work forward into the future, two feet upwards to 131 miles, three feet, 209 miles, four feet, 270, five feet, 319, six feet, 371 miles of our infrastructure. That's enough to build a road from here to New York City. And, and one thing I like to, to point out is I, I highlighted all those unique challenges with the accessibility and connectivity to the, the islands and all the facilities on the islands, those seem to be simpler solutions because there's one way in and one way out. There's a number of, a network of roads that provide access to our agricultural and seafood aquaculture economies, which are our, that, those are our kings. They're our anchor economies at the end of the day. <clears throat> and those are just as vulnerable, but the solutions for those are way more complex than, than one road in, one road out. So when you think about 371 miles, a number of those are providing access that's key to our, our key economies. Um, a quarter of the roads on the Eastern Shore, and we, and we were able to figure out that um, it's disproportionate amongst the counties. Now, when would it occur? We chose to, uh, working with our Transportation Technical Advisory Committee and our Climate Adaptation Working Group, a very stakeholder-driven process, we decided to use the, the VIMS uh, sea level rise projections and, and use a range of the curves from highest down to the low scenario. And uh, so we, we chose to ignore the historic projections. And so essentially we got a, a range, and, th and these were all adjusted for local substance for, for the Eastern Shore as well, which we need major help getting uh, enhanced substance data. Um, but one foot, 2025 to 2050, and then going out to as soon as 2090 would be the the worst case scenario for us with the quarter of the roads. So how and when, um, again, this is accessibility. Uh, we looked at, we identified over uh, 50 communities and facilities. We applied this criteria from, from green down to red, basically looking at uh, green meaning 
this is how it is today. It floods regularly with storm surge, that kind of thing. You learn to live with it. Uh, the yellow access, access to community is limited. That means at least one way into the community or the facility is, is compromised. You're gonna have to come up with a, a, a different plan to provide regular access. But you're still high and dry, you're okay, you're functional. Orange gets a little worse. Your community's viable, but you're not gonna be able to get there. But the majority of the, the, the roads, the majority of the area in the community or at that facility are uh, high and dry, with the exception of storm surge, of course. And then the red is uh, uh, the majority of the roads in the community and all the access roads inundated on a regular basis. So, and, and, uh, and you can see, I didn't really point out, I know it's hard to see these maps, but on the left is one foot of sea level rise. And you can see the light blue areas are the areas subject to inundation by 2025 to 2050. And then on the sixth, you see a number of more reds and oranges. We, we don't want the reds and oranges, really, so um, that's not, not ideal. And this is another way to illustrate what we're talking about. So if you look at this from Northampton County on the left table and, and Accomack on the right, uh, from left to right, you see one foot out to six feet of, of sea level rise. And it just gives you a sense of, of how to approach these problems. So I'll point out, um, on the Accomac list there, if you look at Shinkatig and Shinkatig National Wildlife Refuge up there, um, it, it shows that, you know, outwards to two feet of sea level rise, th those communities could, those communities and facilities, which we've got two million people going out to Assateague Island on any given year. It's a, a, a huge economic driver for us. It could be functional, but uh, we're going to have ac access issues because the Shinkatig Causeway will be underwater at least at each high tide cycle, if not um, worse at all tide cycles. So the recommendations that came out of the study, um, we wanted to update it on regular intervals, obviously, and, uh, and even since we did this in 2015, there's been a, a great amount of information that's come out and, it, and will continue to come out uh, that we need to incorporate. Education and outreach, uh, this is very eye-opening to pretty much everybody I present it to. Um, but there's still work that needs to be done because even though we have uh, presented this information, it hasn't really moved the needle to the point where at the local level, specific policies are being adopted and, and at the state level for, for that matter too. Um, we need additional studies to look at all the other things that we've ignored uh, so far too with ditches, uh, utilities, signalization, rights of way, uh, a, a number of other things to address here and, uh, and then even the cost of figuring out how much these projects cost could be prohibitive to uh, our localities and our, and our budgeted funds from VDOT. So we don't even know how much these costs exactly, all these problems cost to fix, and, uh, and, and that's gonna be a challenge in itself. And so um, neither of our counties have included uh, um, any of these vulnerable road segments in their six-year prioritization plan, which is the primary way to get uh, secondary fund, secondary road reconstruction projects completed, and it's yet to be incorporated into our long-range transportation plan, but we hope to do so in the in the near future. Um, in terms of data and information needs, uh, one of the lowest hanging fruits is is uh, digitizing the VDOT right of ways. We we have trouble figuring out where VDOT actually um, has responsibility uh, for, for their, their infrastructure. So knowing where VDOT property and right away begins and ends would be uh, uh, greatly helpful. Um, a, a lot of work has been done in other regions looking at ownership and maintenance responsibilities with regards to ditches. Um, that is an entirely complex situation and, uh, and, and needs a lot of focus. Uh, I've mentioned the unique challenges, specifically uh, wetland impacts. Do we have enough available wetland credits, wetland mitigation credits um, available to our region to even support these projects should we have enough money? There's another barrier. I mentioned the poor foundations. The, the funding challenges, um, there's no need to, to beat on this one, but uh, obviously, you know, this is a, a potentially insurmountable problem, but uh, even with recent policy changes with regards to how transportation funds have been spent, it's getting harder for rural localities to fund secondary road reconstruction projects. Um, the Smart Scale program 
um, has, has basically uh, sh had it made a shift, it forced a shift at the local level f where historically the counties in their six year prioritization plan were able to accomplish what was in their six year plan, um, but now they're having to, to, to dip into smart scale funding to get those projects done, but based off the criteria, they're just not competitive projects. So what's happening is local governments, at least on the Eastern Shore, are, are needing to compete for uh, smart scale funding, and the only competitive projects are along our highway, which historically VDOT had always, that had been their focus, the localities focused on the secondary roads. So it's been a major shift that's causing lots of issues. And the maintenance cost with these uh, facilities is only gonna worsen with time as, as they become more frequently inundated. Salt water is not good for, for anything when you're talking infrastructure. Unless you're doing, talking about uh, clam cages or oyster cages, but that's, that's all right. But, uh, and then on the, on the state and local level, I mentioned the, the lack of local policies. Our transportation advisory committee even struggled with how to develop criteria for prioritizing all of these problems, which roads need work. And so it, the question came down, well, do we give more points for projects that need it, or do we take points away? Um, it's, we're just starting to have those discussions, and the elected officials, uh, it hasn't even gotten to the elected officials yet, so a long ways to go there. And at the state level, the elephant in the room, uh, at least from the local government's perspective, is that VDOT has the authority to, to up and move the road maintenance sign on any of these secondary roads at any given time. So if it becomes too costly, too too, too prohibitive to maintain that road, they can move it backwards. And it's, this has been done, and, and, and by law, it, it, the responsibility reverts to the, to the localities. And, and for us, we simply do not have the bandwidth or the capacity to manage those roads should that scenario occur. And um, those were the main points, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Hirschner's uh, presentation. But um, I, I thank you all for, uh, for listening to me and, and uh, pray for us, so. <laughs> Everything he said is true. <laughs> so um, the, the goal for us is to see whether or not we can use the most recently available information to, again, help identify the scope of this problem uh, and then provide information which may ultimately become useful in making some of the policy and management decisions, for example, uh, which roads do you continue to maintain, which roads do you give up on, and what are the consequences of those decisions. And so the way we're, we're going after this is using a lot of the currently available uh, LIDAR information, that's the fine scale topographic information. And what I'm showing you here, Kurt mentioned the uh, challenge of knowing where ditches are. Uh, you would think it would be pretty simple, you drive down the road, there's a ditch beside you, you think, well, everybody knows where they are. It turns out that we don't. Uh, and it turns out to be increasingly important, not only for road maintenance decisions, but if you follow the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, you know that uh, management of roadside ditches is one of the proposed BMPs for managing runoff from adjacent lands, particularly in agricultural areas. And so again, knowing where the ditches are, what they look like, and where they're headed uh, becomes really important. And the group in uh, CCRM has uh, come up with some pretty interesting uh, solutions to finding the ditches, mapping where they are, and calculating their volume uh, knowing something about their, their shape and, and uh, position on the landscape. And it, it's not a trivial task, I can say. Uh, and I'm not the one doing the work, and I'm still impressed by how difficult it is. So here's, here's the Eastern Shore, and this is one of the easier ones. So this is looking at Route 13 running up the spine of the, of the, uh, the area, and it's pretty easy to pick out the ditches that are adjacent to that road. But when you move off of that into some of the secondary roads, you can see the, some of the challenges that emerge. One, the, road, or the ditches are not clearly defined on all sides of the road, if they even exist. Uh, you run into problems with the available information simply because of overhanging trees, which prevent you from actually seeing the uh, elevations. 
So there is a lot of work to be done. We've been going back and forth with Kurt and with the VDOT folks on the Eastern Shore, but there is uh, a lot of work in doing a preliminary assessment and then iteratively improving that information so that it can ultimately roll into their planning, uh, local planning. In addition, of course, we are now looking at the latest and greatest in sea level rise projections and trying to understand exactly what that means for road flooding. What Kurt was reporting to you was what a lot of us had done initially, actually following their lead, in looking at road centerline elevations and estimating future sea levels and calculating when those roads would go underwater. We know that that's not necessarily uh, the, the things that people are responding to because roads go underwater frequently due to storm events and understanding the frequency with which roads flood and become and or become impassable and how that influences decision making by local property owners is what we are currently working on. And to do that, we're, we're taking uh, information on sea level rise projections. This all comes off the uh, ADAPT Virginia website. Uh, if you want to read about this and other sea level rise projections, you just go to adaptva.org. Um, more information than you will ever want to know. And the, the challenge for roads is if indeed we know what the elevation of the road is, we know what the current um, uh, frequency of tide elevations are, we can estimate or we can actually know how frequently that road has gone underwater and then we can raise the elevation of tides by whatever the sea level rise projection is and we can see in the future what the probability of road flooding will be and we can use that information to map well that would be more impressive if you could have seen the other uh, sea level rise at any rate here's here's the analysis of the frequency of flooding uh, based on the return frequency of water levels over the last 19 years we use 19 years because it's a tidal epoch that's how long we monitor tide levels to calculate the uh, tidal benchmarks. But if you look back 19 years, here's how frequently waters have reached these various elevations. You can see that it's two feet. Um, and these are all done on NAVD 88, which is a consistent benchmark uh, for elevations across, across the nation, actually. Uh, but it's the one that is used for a much on-land construction. So instead of working to tidal benchmarks, which vary around the region, these are all done to NAVD 88. And you can see here, for the, this was from the Sewell's Point gauge in Hampton Roads, how frequently water levels were greater than uh, two feet, three feet, four feet, five feet, six feet uh, above NAVD 88. It turns out that uh, about zero is about mean sea level right now for NAVD 88. Not exactly, but close enough. And so with this information, we can look at elevations of roads, properties, structures, and estimate how frequently, one, they have been flooded, and then looking at sea level rise, how frequently they are likely to be flooded given no change in the frequency of storm events. So in a case, in, in a sense, it may be a best case scenario. Here we've, we've been looking at uh, parcels on the eastern shore in Accomack County, and I'm gonna flip through these very quickly. The point is if you watch, it, it does exactly what you would expect, that the frequency of flooding constricts the area that is never flooded um, as we go from the present through 2050 to 2100. And, and the question being asked is the one that Kurt actually was or referring to. It's not just are these always gonna be underwater, but now we know how frequently they're gonna be underwater. And is it the people and the structures that are there or is it the roads serving them? And that's the analysis that we are trying to do. Here's, here's that analysis done in Gloucester County. In Gloucester, we were trying to predict uh, just how tolerant property owners would be to frequent, frequent return floods of either their homes or their properties or the roads that serve their properties so that we could begin to model when they decide to just get out of Dodge uh, and basically impact the tax base for the, the locality. And what you're seeing here is a small area in Gloucester. This is on the Ware River, if that means anything to you. Um, and the little green dots are the houses, the roads you can see, and what's colored 
is the annual duration of flooding in hours per year, the average uh, time in hours per year that the roads are underwater or that the houses are flooded. And as you step forward in time, no surprise, the amount of time that they are flooded begins to increase uh, up to 2100 when there are clearly sections of these roads that will almost always be underwater. The point is if you look at that circle, uh, that road becomes impassable by 2050 uh, on a fairly regular basis, but the houses that are served are still above the, the regular flood waters, so they aren't inundated nearly as frequently. And the question is, if you live there, uh, how much of loss of access will you tolerate before you want to leave, and or if you're the local government, how much does that loss of access concern you for provision of services? You can't get fire and rescue and police out there under these conditions. Uh, does that become a matter that needs to be incorporated into your one road maintenance and development plans and or your land use planning? And so the way we are doing this is to use that very fine scale uh, analysis of road elevations and frequency of flooding and begin to look at service areas. So again, here's, here's Gloucester County and basically the network of roads that serve Gloucester County. And what we are looking at is as, you, as water levels come up, which areas get cut off. So this is not which homes get flooded or which parcels get flooded, it's which of those areas have their road access cut off due to inundation of the road. So here's a two-foot flood, here's a three-foot flood, and what, whoop, let me go back one second. What you're supposed to be watching is the growth of little gray areas. Uh, so obviously out closer to the coast, areas are getting cut off, and again, it's not because those homes are getting flooded. And here's the, uh, the average duration. So these are the sorts of numbers that we're able to generate now, or we're trying to generate for local governments to help them plan for where they want to direct their road maintenance, when, what decisions they want to make about raising roads, about uh, maintaining roads, or about abandoning roads. Because as Kurt was pointing out, doing anything with these roads is enormously expensive. And the question is how many people benefit, how many lose based on those decisions. So we can, we can map the, uh, the average sort of duration of flooding. This is what has existed on the Gloucester roads from the last 18 years. Here it is in estimated in 2050, given what we expect for sea level rise, and here it is in 2100. And it's interesting to note that that red area down in the southeast corner of Gloucester is where there is a large community of people that originally was all watermen, uh, but increasingly is uh, invaded, depending on your perspective, uh, by people building McMansions along the, the shoreline. And so there is a lot of tax dollars uh, that are derived from that area by homes that don't necessarily flood but who lose access on a regular basis. And so we know this problem is coming. The challenge is, what do we do? Well, unfortunately, Carl made that sound like I have all the answers and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Say that straight up. Um, a couple of important takeaways, I think, from those presentations. Number one, as Carl said, it's the road flooding that's going to be driving people out of areas in the future before the building flooding. So transportation is a key part of this discussion. Uh, a second important point is the Eastern Shore was on the cutting edge of this. Good, good job, Kurt. He's exactly right. That's why we asked him to speak today, because they have done some vulnerability assessments out there. Um, so one of the important things that we need to do is fully incorporate resilience into our planning for transportation. Make sure that it is taken into account every step of the way. We need state authorized predictive data. As Carl has been showing you, he has data. Uh, NOAA has data. The Corps of Engineers has data. But we need to have the blessing of the state in order to, uh, for VDOT and localities to feel comfortable, which data do we look at when we're trying to become more resilient. And then we need to do these vulnerability assessments and figure out what is the impact on our transportation infrastructure statewide, not just the Eastern Shore, I'm sorry, Kurt, but statewide. And, um, and that, of course, triggers questions that, like Kurt raised, about who owns the drainage ditches, which part of it is a VDOT drainage ditch, which is a private ditch the VDOT has no jurisdiction over. That's an important question. 
Um, and we need design standards then that uh, address resilience. Do we need to raise roads? If we do raise roads, we have to do it selectively and carefully. But when we do, we need some uh, design standards. We need to look at things like rust resistant metal concrete reinforcements if it's in a sea level rise vulnerable area, making sure that we have adequate stormwater drainage at all times. Uh, many of you all may recall the S Virginia Supreme Court case, Livingston versus VDOT, in which uh, the court said that VDOT was responsible for maintaining its drainage system for the Capitol Beltway, including a portion of Cameron Run a naturally occurring stream that they had diverted as part of their drainage system. So it's an important issue. Um, and of course we have important issues like the Port of Virginia. Um, we have to make sure that it's accessible not just by water, but by rail and by road as well. And so resilience has to be taken into account at all the different layers. And speaking of the duty to maintain, one question that we hear from localities is, so, so how long does a jurisdiction actually have to keep maintaining a road that's subject to recurrent flooding? How often, how much of our transportation budget do we put towards a road that's gonna be recurringly flooding more and more in the future? So it's important to have some clarity on that issue. Um, there may, you may recall some of you that this past spring there was an unfortunate situation where Gloucester County posted uh, a road to be subject to flooding and immediately was threatened with a lawsuit by people that lived on that road um, because they were trying to sell their home. And so there's some important impacts here that need to be discussed to have the, both the state and the localities be in that comfort zone to take actions that they need to take. And finally, it all comes back to funding, which is a, a great key up for our next panel. Unfortunately, the legislators get to hear about that all the time. You know, show me the money, right? Um, we need to review our state funding sources to make sure that the funding is available and sufficient to address resilience, to address potential retrofits. And an example is if we do decide to raise a road, then it can potentially create a change in the hydrology for that area and unintentionally create a, a dam and have impacts on people's properties. So that takes studies. And if you raise a road, you need to go outside of your footprint most probably, and you need to acquire some land and put in place additional stormwater drainage measures. So all of that requires funding, and that's gonna be the subject of our next, next panel. But um, we do have a student, Amber, who is ready with a microphone, I believe, or Casey. So I know you must have questions for the panel. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand and Casey will bring you the microphone. I'm over here. Oh, and Amber as well, <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Paul is over here. Hi, that was a great presentation. Uh, two quick questions, one um, for you, Elizabeth. The second one, perhaps, for you, Dr. Hirschberg. Hirschner, sorry. First question is, and I was re reading a paper published by William and Mary, uh, authored by Trip Pollard a couple of years ago. In that, I saw a line that I wasn't, I'd never seen before, and it says, in state legislation, their uh, transportation projects are required to take uh, flooding and coastal risks into account. Are you familiar with that paper? Actually, no. Yeah, I, I thought we, we say we should do this, we should do this, but it was about four years, three years ago he wrote that, and it said that it's required that they must. So one thing that um, it, we do need to look at is, for example, our abandonment statutes. Our abandonment statutes often talk about abandoning a road because of public use no longer being necessary. And so if we clarify in those statutes that recurrent flooding and actually predicted flooding could be a factor for abandonment as well, that would help. Because one problem is current flooding is one assessment, Paul, but future flooding is another. And so making sure that they have the clarity they need uh, in the state statutes and the authorities, that they can look at the predictive data and figure out what's going to be happening. And then they can make a decision about, do we want to put more money after this road, considering it's going to get worse? So it's not just today's flooding that needs to be looked at. And VDOT does, I believe, in some situations look at flooding. Right, that was my point, that the future road construction, as an engineer, we should not be putting right. money towards roads that will be at risk. That's exactly and I, right. And uh, I'll share you that citation uh, during a break. Great. Um, that kind of leads to my question to you, Carl. Assuming that there will be some communities that will be cut off but do have um, significant money in the community, did your research in Gloucester illuminate any communities that would consider private roads and actually building their own roads to access their communities using their own money, like through an HOA or something? 
the simple answer is no. <laughs> uh, one, we did we did not uh, go to that that level of analysis. And from what I know about Gloucester, I'd defer to Delegate Hodges, but I don't know of any communities that are stepping up and offering to do that. I know of communities who know they're at risk, uh, but the costs have been so high that no. these guys. <laughs> Good idea. Hi, uh, Speaker Pollard with Williams Mullen. Thanks for that pre great presentation. A um, couple things. Um, one of the things that's sort of lurking behind this and it was alluded to is, is the economics. Um, and I think one of the things we've got to think about in terms of further studies about this is Having a really good economics model, economic model for how to cost these things out, um, the, not only the community but the landowners, and trying to figure out how to um, have a pathway for understanding what those economic impacts are to help prioritize some of these projects. There's not just you know loss of value on the property or the cost of the project itself. There's also uh, a lot of other macro or uh, economic impacts to the community or to the state even from loss of revenues um, that can come from um, some of these uh, some of these impacts, either doing something or not doing something. And I think we need to make sure that we've got a plan in place to have that kind of economic analysis support to these localities and to the PDCs and to the state. So I think that just needs to be as a policy matter thinking about how we provide that support and who's going to do that. Um, I think the other thing is I'd be kind of curious to see how many folks in this room are from business and industry. All right, a handful. <laughs> and I think that's, this has been a consistent issue on this, and, and I've been doing this for a while, and, and one of the things that we've really got to start doing and making sure we're engaging is business and industry in, this, in these issues, particularly when we start looking at things like these infrastructure issues that they depend on so heavily. The port is heavily engaged on this issue, but trying to get all the other shoreline industry and others who depend on the shoreline industries uh, how you get workers in and out of facilities dependent on those uh, roads being flooded or not being flooded and uh, helping them understand how to build resiliency to these I think is another key factor we've got to build into this analysis. Uh, and that will help as well with I think energizing some uh, interest in how to fund these things and maybe help with some of these policy decisions. Thanks. Yes, excellent point. I, um, I'm going to put Admiral Phillips on the spot and ask if she'd like to chime in because I've heard her say that very thing before. <laughs> so. Well, so uh, I think I didn't see the hands, but I didn't see very many just in casting a sideways glance. So, um, so I guess in the military we would say absent without leave. Um, the business community is is certainly not a vocal voice in this environment, and yet I had an opportunity to speak to the Virginia Beach. Executive Committee of the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce, everything has a really long name around here, um, last week, and I, I talked, really, they wanted to know, you know, what was my job, what was I going to do, and, and what were the governor's priorities, and uh, they were fascinated. Nobody got up and left. I mm -hmm. talked about the need to develop funding processes. They all were interested in that. People came up to me afterwards and said, how can we help? So there is an interest, maybe, um, this may be a, a, a pie in the sky hope, but some, to some extent, as I was sitting here listening to you, thinking, I was like, how many of them were invited? Um, and, and maybe it's just a matter of trying to get the two communities together more often and more frequently um, to start to generate, you know, tease out who's, who's in the game and who's not in the game, and then bring more people into the game. Uh, certainly, again, I know Kit Shope is here. The port is an avid uh, participant in this. I know Virginia Maritime VMA is very interested in this. Uh, other parts of our maritime industry perhaps not so much, but um, if they see others participating, perhaps we can bring them along. So that's you know, a, one of the many things that kind of fall into uh, the job tasks that go with my new position. So I'll be working on that and appreciating your help. <laughs> um, that's an important point that Speaker raised and um, it also is reminding me that I should tell you that um, 
we had a conference last year on sea level rise and its impacts on national security. So we did discuss the military aspects of this and Colonel Olson, who participated in that, I think you might be raising actually an even earlier uh, conference session that had Trip Pollard. That's probably what you're looking at for the paper, I'm guessing. So um, I would encourage you, this whole day will be taped and available on our website. And also there are the prior conferences taped as well. So please take a look at the discussion. Anyone else have questions? All right, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and then we'll be coming back